All right. So, on Friday we were talking about the conics, and um, you told me that when you have subtraction and addition with different numbers, that it means different conics, and when you only have one square, it means different conics. So. Okay. Could be that. Okay. All right. So a circle has to have the same number in front of x squared and y squared. In this problem, they both have a 1. Same number. And addition is a circle. Now, this one has subtraction in it. So that means that it's uh, what again? Hyperbola. Well, what I've got left now is one that has addition, but these are different numbers with addition. And I have one that has one square. So what have I got left? If it's, this is already, we already chosen a circle on hyperbola, I have left one square is parabola. And that makes the other one what? And lips. So we should be able to just look at the squares and nothing else in the problem and be able to tell which conic we have. And you can even do that when it's in standard form, although the information may be in a little different place in standard form. All right, so what I want to do is stop the video and give you an opportunity just quickly to try the second part of this front page with the independent practice. Alright, so in the next part, uh, what we're going to do is look at standard form equations and we're going to try to identify which conic we have because that will help us to determine which things do we need in order to do the conic. And then, and I know the graphs on there are not very good and I'm so sorry that they didn't turn out very good. When I printed it, I guess blue ink doesn't show up really dark with um, black because <laughs> if obviously I didn't print them in color. Um, but um, we have to continue to think about which conic we have because, and, and this is what's the tricky part about this, I technically don't have to teach this part right here because this is going to be how you could check your own work with the calculus side. You would come back and do the algebra side, which I'm about to review with you. But if you don't know what the conic gives you, you don't know what you're looking for. So it, it will help us to review also what you look for with each conic. So this one in standard form, um, can you give me some idea of how you think you would go about looking at this form and deciding which conic it is? Look at the denominators, all right. So there's addition. So that makes it either circle or ellipse because it has two squares, right? But these are not the same number, which means one way is longer than the other way. So no ellipse. All right. An ellipse has vertices. Well, first, wait a minute. Center first. It has a center. Then it has vertices. It has co-vertices. It has a foci. Um, so these are the things that we would really focus on. Now, when I look at a formula, the most important out of this entire list would be your vertices and your co-vertices. Because if you know where they are, you can count to the center and find your center. Does that make sense? And once you find your center, you would have your A and your B that come from this 4 and 9. And then you could find your foci without having to complete the square. Does that make sense? So on a calculus-based problem, we would do derivatives and find those vertices. And that's what I want to show you all after we learn review how to do all of this work with algebra. I want to show you all the calculus side and show you how you don't have to complete the square but completing the square can be very important for checking it. So you make sure you got all the answers right.
All right, so we're supposed to take the information where and make a center out of it. That's what? Inside the parentheses. Inside the parentheses. Okay, so what do we do to make this center on this question? Right, make them the opposite, positive 3 and negative 2. Now with vertices, you got to pay attention because there's a major axis and there's a minor axis with a um, ellipse and the one that's the major one is the longer one. So is X or Y longer? Y is longer. So we that will make this A and you take the square root and get 3 and then you take the square root of this one and it'll be B. And why that's important is because if we're doing this with algebra, we have to count that far out from the center to find our information. And when we go to plug it in to find the foci, we have to know the bigger one is A. Yes, I did. Thank you. I meant to write B equals 2. I can't write and talk at the same time sometimes. <laughs> All right, so since our center is in quadrant 4, and we're not really having to go a tremendous amount out on each side. We may can put our x, y axis in the center, but I think I'd off-center it slightly because we really don't need a lot of the negative side. I think we could off-center it that much and then we'd have plenty of room. So what we've got to do, and I wish that I could put the... Um, X, Y axis in these sometimes ahead of time, but don't ever know where we need it. So 3, negative 2, we're going to go over 3 and down to negative 2, and we're going to label C next to that to remind us that's our center. And then we're going to count out 3 in a Y direction and out 2 from the next direction so that we can get our co-vertices and vertices. So up 3, 1, 2, 3, and down 3, 1, 2, 3, are our vertices. And we put V next to each of those. And then our co-vertices are out 2, and we put CV next to them. And then we list those points out over here. So where is my vertices that's at the top? All right. And where is the other vertices at at the bottom? Negative 5. Now, if you did this right, you should be able to look at this negative 2 and add 3 to it and take 3 away, and you'd have those two numbers. And that'd be a great check also. All right, where are my co-vertices? Uh-huh. All right, and again, those x values change from this 3 so if I take 3 away, I get 1. If I add, excuse me, if I take 2 away from 3, I get 1. And if I take 2 away and add it to 3, I get 5. So I don't have to graph it to get those. I could just add and subtract that number to the vertices, from the center to the vertices, for which direction is more important. All right. Now, our first side, if you remember, was a formula. Anybody remember anything about that formula? How about if I said it was almost Pythagorean theorem? Would that give you a hint? Okay, not that kind of almost Pythagorean theorem. Okay, Pythagorean theorem. No, no. Take it. Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, right? This is an ellipse, which is a plus problem. So your, your Pythagorean theorem ends up with a minus in it. And it's the opposite of that with hyperbola. Hyperbola has a minus in the formula, so the Pythagorean theorem is the real Pythagorean theorem with a hyperbola. But with ellipse, it's almost the same thing, except it just has a subtraction instead of add, because we want to make sure that we're looking for vertices that are inside this picture. And if we add, they'll be outside. Does that make sense? So it's a squared minus b squared equals c squared. So it's almost Pythagorean theorem. It's just got one slight difference, and that's that subtraction sign, which is why it's important that we know which one is a, because you want to take the little one away from the big one. And here's another thought. These are already squared. In your formula, a squared is already there, and b squared is already there. So you just do the big one minus the small one. 
9 minus 4 is what? And then you take the square root of it and you got your C. Now, if that number is not a perfect number, like the square root of 5 is not perfect, then we're going to write our foci a little differently than if we actually could count off on our graph. Okay? Right. We're going to put plus or minus. And who gets it? X or Y? Y gets it because it has to be based on which one is the more important one. So plus or minus the square root of 5 goes on the negative 2. But to put it on our graph, we would estimate the, the, that and count it. So the estimate for the square root of 5 is what, about 2.2? I think that's about right. And we're going to go up to 1, 2, and about part of another one, and down to a part of another one. And there's our foci. And if I had a pencil, it might look a little, left a little better than it does with these big fat markers. So there is our ellipse with everything labeled. All right, is this coming back to you slightly? A little bit? All right. So our next comment is what? How do you know? Oh, it only has one square. Okay. So what are the important parts of a parabola? Other than the fact that I've got parentheses here telling me something, there must be other parts. There's a min or a max, okay. There's a vertex. And the min and max happen at the vertex. And the interesting thing about it is, actually, this is the only one that the center is at the vertex. They're the same point. Because you have a directrix and you have a focus, and the center is between the two of them, and it has to be the vertex. But what is very different about this than what you're more familiar with with parabolas is these parabolas could open up, down, left, or right. So when we talk about max and min, we usually talk about that with the ones that open up and down because they're y equal to equations like y equals ax squared plus bx plus c formulas. These are not that kind of formula. So therefore, we won't focus on the max or min word, but we will focus on the vertex word. Um, so we have to get a vertex, a focus. We only have one. See, both sides plural because you have a one on each side for uh, ellipse, but we only have one. But then we have a directrix, which is like an imaginary line in the background. Now, that means I need to know which way this parabola is going to open. If it's going to open up, down, left, or right, because th when they open left and right, they're not functions. The only time they're functions is when they open up or down. All the other conics aren't functions. This is the only one that could have a chance of being one, and that's assuming that it opens up or down. What position in your formula do you need to look at in order to determine that um, is very important. All right, so um, does anybody remember what part of the formula, like the squared side or the not squared side, is the important side to tell you the opening? Part? Not the not squared. So you look at this. Whoa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Um, you have to look at two things. You have to look at what letter you have and what sign is in front of that letter on the non-squared side. So X's go left or right, correct? But this number in front of the parentheses is positive. So therefore, since this is a positive with X, this was going to go to the right. Like open that way. So since it's going to be a right opening um, parabola, that means my focus is going to move to the right also. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Now, with the vertex, you got to be so careful because X isn't first in this formula. And that sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. So it moves around in parabola. Parabola's the, well, no, it's not the only one. Hyperbola also does. So where is my vertex? Negative 2, 1. All right. Now, we don't have to move, move a tremendous amount in this particular question for negative 2, 1, but let's figure out how much we might need to move for the focus, and that'll tell us if we can put it in the center or not. And that's all based on this 4. 
that's you're supposed to say 4a equals whatever number is sitting in front of that parentheses because 4 gets multiplied times the distance that you move for the focus a represents that distance distance from vertex to focus so A is what in this problem? 1. So I think we're good if we put it in the middle. What do you think? Just put the X, Y axis in the middle. Okay. Every time I touch anything but the smart board part, it wants to move everything around. Alright, so we're going to do negative 2, 1 for our vertex. So over negative 2, up 1. Label that V. And then, because our parabola opens to the right, that A equals 1 means move 1 to the right to, for your focus. So it's just right beside it. Now, I don't know how wide to make that. I don't really know how wide this parabola should be, so I just kind of put a facsimile in there. So where did my focus end up? That's right, negative 1, 1. And because it went to the right, it looks like I added 1 to the vertex to get the focus. Does that make sense? So I should subtract 1 and move back 1 to the left for the directrix. Now, does anybody remember what the directrix is? That's right, it's an asymptote. It's a vertical line on this problem because it's all about x. And so it's back. Did I do that in the wrong place? I sure did. That's where it's supposed to be. My V was in the way. Um, it's supposed to be 1 to the left of the vertex. So that puts it on negative 3. Does everybody agree? Now this is an imaginary line behind your parabola. So that's why I'm putting it as a dotted. And you have to know which letter is most important in your problem to make your vertical or horizontal asymptote. Because sometimes it's horizontal depending on which way your graph opens. And this is x equals negative 3. Alright, so our x equals negative 3 comes again from the fact that our parentheses has a number in front of x. So x is the most important variable here. And that's how I know my directrix needs to go up and down through the x-axis because it's all about x. You also could tell it can't go through your parabola, so it's got to go a direction that wouldn't go through your parabola as well. All right, any questions about doing a parabola? Because it isn't always this way. Sometimes they're turned a different way. Uh, sometimes X is over here in the squared part and Y is over there. And that would make it open up or down. So you got to pay attention to that. All right. So... Okay, that's right. Here's another way you can do it also if you, if you can't remember that. If you divide and make it equal to 1 like a, a, an ellipse formula would be done because ellipse and hyperbola is all equals equal to 1, you'd have the same number under each one. And that would also be a clue that this is a circle because circles always have the same number under each one if it's equal to 1. But I don't want to do that because th that number on the end has something to do with the radius, right? But that's another clue. If you started thinking of it like an ellipse, you'd find out your ellipse is a perfect circle. Because it's one of those catch-22 things, you know, like we've talked about before. Every circle is an ellipse, but not every ellipse is a circle. Square. Like square and rectangle. Exactly. So, in circle, what is the most important features the center and radius okay center and radius so we have less features on a circle which is a good thing because we've got to have some of these problems that are short and quick right so where is the center on this one okay negative four negative three and that means it's going to be down in quadrant um, Three, okay. So since it's going to be down to quadrant three, we might want a little bit more. 
of um, negative. So I can move that over a little bit more probably. Yeah, something like that maybe. And what's my radius and how do I find that? That's right. You take this value right here. The square root of that is your radius. So I don't have to count out very far on this one, thank goodness. Um, so being able to have just a little bit more quadrant 3 was a good thing. So if we plot negative 4, negative 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, Whoa. Did y'all see that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. Yes, it does. All right, I'm going to let y'all plot yours while I line the board because that is definitely off, and I'm going to stop the video while I do that. Don't know why it won't let me touch the board, but oh well. Oh well. Let's see if I can draw all around it. Um. So if y'all put negative 4, negative 3 here, <laughs> yeah, I know, it won't let me draw it. It won't let me close that box down there either. And you go up 3, 1, 2, 3, and you go down 3, 1, 2, 3, and you go over 3, and you go over here. Is that what y'all did? Somewhat. <laughs> with the lousy graph. But the key is, is it going to look circular even if you plot all those points right? It looks somewhat circular. The only problem is, is it's very difficult for us to stay at equal distance from the center all the way around when we don't have points in between these. So sometimes it looks a little off. Alright. Let me pause the video here for a second. So, in looking at our last one, this is obviously hyperbola because it has that subtraction sign between the squares. What are the important features of a hyperbola? Does anybody remember? All right, it has a center. And by the way, we said this earlier, but I want to go back and reiterate it. The only one that we don't say it has a center is parabola because the center is the vertex. And we could say center there, but it also is the vertex, so it's more important to call it the vertex. All right, so obviously it has vertices. How many? How many vertices does it have? Two, not four like ellipse. And you're right, it has foci. But it had something that the others didn't have. Mm-hmm. And we put two dotted lines through it. And what are dotted lines called? Mm-hmm. That's some types. All right. So we got a little different information on different ones. Now, in, it, in circle, it's the same distance in all directions. In ellipse, one way was longer. And how we told one the way was longer was we looked for the bigger number so it could be A. But in hyperbola, Whoever's first is more important because it's in front of subtraction. So A in this problem would have to be the square root of the 25 and B would have to be the square root of 16 not because A is bigger but because A is before the subtraction. So whatever comes first in this problem is more important. So uh, keep that in mind because parabola and hyperbolas are the only two formulas in which it can open in any direction. And because of that, you got to know which way to open it. So in this problem, it's all about X. So it's going to open right and left. But it could have been up and down if I had put the Y first. So you may see that on maybe some of the ones you have. So where is my center? 1, 4, OK. And how far am I going to move my vertices to find that from the center? How far am I going to move? I'm going to move them forward. <laughs> All right, so if we plot this one forward, you're saying that I'll move five out 
for the vertices for that because that's the more important number in this problem. So, I don't know, we might need a little bit more positive, but not a whole lot. I'm just going to off-center the y-axis a little bit. I may have off-centered the x-axis by mistake, but oh well. It'll work. One, two, three, four. Yeah. So we've got to move five in an x direction to put our vertices in from this center. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So where are my vertices? It has to do with x. So it had to be 5 from 1 to the right. 5 from 1 would be 6. Okay. And if I go 5 backwards up from 1, negative 4. So you can do the math without counting it on your graph if you, if you want to. Now, this problem doesn't have two sets of vertices. But where the other position would be is important because it has what we call fake vertices. You don't write them in your list, but you need them to draw the rectangle that you were talking about earlier. So I'm going to move up four from my center and put a point, but I'm not going to label it anything. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So you do draw a rectangle in that mm -hmm, because that helps us to figure out kind of how to put our asymptote lines in. And it's a dotted rectangle. It's not real part of the problem. And the only reason you want that is because it helps you to use a ruler to put the asymptote line in. You could do it without it. If you don't want to draw the rectangle, then what you would do is you would um, need these four corners because those four corners are what's necessary. And that's why the rectangle makes it easier to draw the four corners. Because then your asymptote goes through the diagonal both ways. So next, we could probably go in and figure out our asymptote. Now remember, asymptote is based on the point-slope formula. And the point that you put in is your center. So basically, you're using the same two parentheses that you have up here with the squares on it to fill in down here. So the y minus 4 will come down here and be on the left. And the x minus 1 will come down here and be on the right because it's got to be based on the center because it go, the asymptote goes through the center. And your slope is based on this a and this b, but you don't know if it's 5, 4, or 4, 5 until you count it off on your graph rise over run to make sure that you know which one's which. Or you look at it in terms of it's always the y number over the x number because it's all about rise over run. So therefore, it's up 4 and over 5 on the graph. Or you just think about put the y number over the x number. Because rise means y. So in this case, that would be 4 over 5. Now, there are two lines up there. How am I going to tell somebody that there are two different asymptotes? Plus or minus on my slope because one of those has positive slope and one of those has negative slope. So now we have enough information on our graph to basically curve in our parabolas to these dotted lines from the vertex. You can make each half of your parabola curve in to the dotted lines. That's what those asymptote lines are for also. And all we have left to do is our foci. Now like before when we talked about it with ellipse, Hyperbola uses a formula that is based on exactly Pythagorean theorem because the original problem has a subtraction sign, so the Pythagorean theorem gets to keep its plus. So if it's a squared plus b squared equals c squared, 
then that would be 25 plus 16, which is what, 41? Is that right? And that would be the square root of 41 for C. And so we take our center, and which variable is going to get that, the X or the Y? The X, because it's all about right and left in this problem, correct? So we say 1 plus or minus the square root of 41, comma, 4. And that gives us our foci position over here. But to put it on our graph, we kind of need the square root of 41 to know what it approximately is. Isn't that going to be between 6 and 7? So we'll just count from the center over a little more than 6 and put it in. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, just a little bit more than that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and just a little bit more than that. Because we don't know. I mean, I, could, I, I, I can put that dot in there and on my graph. My dot looks huge. You might want to know the decimal point for that. Um, so that you know if it's halfway or less than halfway or more than halfway. But that's my foci. And we put an F next to that to represent foci. All right. How do you feel about what we've gone over so far? Is it coming back to you pretty much? All right. So in your assignment, um, you have a few more of these to practice with. And they may focus on something a little different with the parabola and the hyperbola so you can get some practice with no matter what's important in it. But circle and ellipse are always done the same way. But even the circle, even the ellipse could be different because I might make it longer or a different direction. All right, so that's what you're going to do to finish up your homework.